as you can see, the answer choices are missing, and that is by design. The first step of our process is to cover up the answer choices because we don't want the answer choices to dictate or guide your thought process. And we certainly don't want you to see an answer choice that you are unfamiliar with, which may cause you to panic as you're trying to answer the question. So I'll cover those up for you. After that, we will read the lead in. The lead in is the last sentence of the question itself. So let's go ahead and read that together. Which of the following cytogenic abnormalities is most likely present in this fetus? Which of the following cytogenic, cytogenetic abnormalities is most likely present in this fetus? After we read the lead-in, we like to ask our students how uh, many steps they think this question will require. And the reason we read the lead-in first is because we don't want you, we want you to actually know exactly what the, uh, the question and the test writer are asking so that as you're reading the question, you can pick up on all those relevant clues without having to reread it later on. And the reason why we ask you to let us know how many steps you believe it will take is because we want you to have an organized thought process so you don't make any mistakes on test day and that you answer the right question. So I see some of our veterans letting us know in the question box how many steps this question will require. So with that, let's go ahead and get in to the vignette and begin reading it. A 37-year-old woman in her second trimester of pregnancy presents to the obstetrician's office accompanied by her husband. They are anxious to discuss the results of maternal serum screening performed during their previous visit. Before meeting with the couple, the obstetrician reviews the results of the test and finds that the patient's serum alpha protein, fetal protein, unconjugated uh, estriol, and beta human chorionic gonadotropin, or beta HCG levels, are all low. The inhibin A concentration is normal. The obstetrician becomes concerned about the possibility of congenital abnormalities in this fetus. Which of the following cytogenic abnormalities is most likely present in this fetus? So with that, I want all of you to start thinking about what the important clues are in this vignette as I hand it off to Boris. Thank you, Sean. So we're, we'll go ahead and show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette in the lead-in. So anytime you have demographics, it's going to really start to clue you in into what you should be thinking about. Um, we know this is a pregnancy question, so obviously the trimester is important. And then they're kind of getting at some specific things here with certain levels of, of um, uh, serum tests and, and, you know, whether they're high, normal, low, um, and what that could possibly indicate for this woman. So those things are all important, which uh, levels are high, which are low, which are normal. Um, and then in regards to the lead-in, it's kind of asking specifically about a cytogenetic abnormality that may be present. So we know what we need to focus on. Um, so cytogenetic abnormality. So how many steps do we think this question could be? Um, well, I think this could be one or two steps. I think one based off those levels, I think we need to come up with the diagnosis. Um, and then two based, and it, it maybe depends on the answer choices, but um, based off that diagnosis, what would be a cytogenetic abnormality? Um, so maybe a two-step question here. So let's go ahead and take a look at those answer choices. Um, and we should have five answer choices. And we recommend that when students go through the, the answer choices, that they actually start at the bottom um, at answer choice E and work their way up to the top. Um, what we see is a lot of times students will, um, you know, they'll start at the top, go down to the bottom, um, and they'll see something they like. They'll go ahead and select it, and it actually turns out to be incorrect. Um, and the reason is they never got through all the answer choices. So doing it this way, going from the bottom up, makes sure uh, ensures that you um, see all the answer choices, read them, and that you're not biasing yourself. So let's go ahead and do that now. Answer choice E, non-disjunction of chromosome 21. D, non-disjunction of chromosome 18. C, non-disjunction of chromosome 13. B, 5P deletion. And lastly, A, 22Q11 microdeletion. So we're gonna go ahead and open up that poll. Go ahead and select uh, what you think may be a cytogenetic abnormality that's likely present in this fetus, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Barra. So we'll give all of you a few seconds here to respond and let us know what you believe the most correct answer is. 
Remember that on test day, there is no penalty for guessing, and certainly there isn't one tonight. We'll wait until about two thirds of you have responded, and then we will go over the correct and incorrect answer choices. We'll give all of you a few more seconds here. I see the responses coming in. There seems to be a favorite. And remember always that when you're reviewing these questions, you are ensuring that you got it right for the right reason. So let's take a look. It looks like 42% of you selected non-disjunction of chromosome 21, and 37% of you selected non-disjunction of chromosome 18. So it's pretty close. Let's see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is D, non-disjunction of chromosome 18, and 37% of you got it right. Clearly a challenging question. If you got it right, let's make sure you got it right for the right reasons. If you got it wrong, don't worry. Boris is going to explain it to you now. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, definitely a tough question. So um, we've gone ahead and pulled up some uh, images and tables from first aid. Um, and the important thing to note is the timing of the screening. So remember, there's only certain things that can be checked that are accurate um, at the first trimester. So um, we know this patient was second trimester screening. So let's take a look at that table. So keep in mind that uh, the differences between trisomy 13, 18, and 21. Okay, and you can see there that with trisomy 21, the beta HCG and inhibin A are elevated, and estriol and AFP are low. Versus with uh, trisomy 18, HCG is low, inhibin can be low or normal, and estriol and AFP are also low. So let's go back to our vignette. We know here that the, that the uh, HCG, AFP, and S trial are low. And then they also told us the inhibin A concentration is normal, which we know that can be either low or normal. So this is most suggestive of trisomy 18. Um, and this is also known as, known as Edwards syndrome. Uh, patients present with uh, a prominent occiput, classically rocker bottom feet, intellectual disability. Um, clenched uh, fists and some other abnormalities. Um, and uh, trisomies usually are the result of non-disjunction of chromosomes during meiosis, okay? Um, and it's, in this case, non-disjunction of chromosome 18. So that's why uh, answer choice D is the best answer. For those of you who selected answer choice E, keep in mind this is trisomy 21, um, also known as Down syndrome. And as mentioned, that would have uh, a low AFP and S trial, um, but elevated HCG and inhibit, which is not the case in this patient. Okay, so that would not be correct. Answer choice C or 13, um, this is also known as Patau syndrome. Um, se second trimester screening for this is actually not very sensitive, um, and so you get a lot of normal levels. Okay, um, first trimester screening may be a little bit more accurate. And we know that this patient was screened in the second trimester. Uh, answer choice B, uh, 5P deletion, that's indicative of uh, Cree du Chat syndrome. Um, and this disorder can be diagnosed uh, in utero. There's some classic signs and symptoms like a cat like cry, uh, but that's not what we're getting at with the levels that they're giving us. And then lastly, answer choice A, uh, this is getting at de George syndrome. Um, and this is not something that usually is detected. Um, via pre, uh, prenatal maternal serum screening. So um, also incorrect. So the best answer choice here is D. Excellent. Thank you, Paris. Great job, everyone. You uh, had a, definitely a challenging question, and hopefully you learned from it, and we'll get it right on test day. Remember, this is a learning process, so it's okay to get a question wrong when you're practicing. With that, let's go ahead and move on to our second question of the evening. Once again, the answer choices are covered up. That is by design. So let's begin by reading the vignette. This patient is at greatest risk for which of the following complications? This patient is at greatest risk for which of the following complications? So I'll give all of you a few moments here to let us know in the question box how many steps you believe this question will require. I see some responses coming in. 
let's go ahead and read that vignette. A 32-year-old Premi Gravid woman presents at 32 weeks gestation because of a sudden vaginal bleeding and painful abdominal cramps. She denies trauma. She has a 10-pack year smoking history and admits to cocaine use during her pregnancy. Her blood pressure is 95 over 60, pulse is 112, and blood oxygen saturation is 97% on room air. And they give us normals there from 95 to 99%. Physical examination reveals a tense abdomen with a firm, tender uterus. The urinalysis shows no protein, leukocytes, or bacteria with few RBCs. Pelvic examination reveals dark red blood in the vaginal vault and a hypertonic uterus. Pelvic ultrasound shows a high posterior placenta with no abnormalities of placentation. Fetal heart tones indicate fetal distress. This patient is at greatest risk for which of the following complications? I want all of you to start thinking about the relevant clues in this vignette as I hand it off to Boris. Thank you, Sean. So once again, we'll go ahead and show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette. And as you can imagine, as Sean was reading it, there are probably a lot of important things here. So this is a prim and gravid woman, keep in mind, how many pregnancies a, a, uh, someone has had um, can point you in certain directions of diseases and risk factors, so that's important. How many weeks is she? Obviously, that's very important. Um, and what is she presenting with? You know, sudden vaginal bleeding and painful cramps um, makes you think a little bit. Um, we know she uh, has some drug history, some social issues that give us some important vitals that we've highlighted. Um, and then also some very important lab tests and physical exam findings as well, okay? They also gave us an ultrasound, so an imaging finding, and that's always going to be useful um, whenever you have a pregnancy as well. So they gave us a lot of information. All of it's important. All of it is going to be needed to tie things in together. So it's nice that when you go, go through a long question like this, you highlight what is important. So, you know, when you need to go back and look at it again, you're not wasting time trying to figure out, oh, what's important in this vignette, you've already gone ahead and done that to begin with. So now let's go ahead and take a look at that lead-in question. So they're asking us, uh, what's the, what risk is greatest um, in terms of complications for this patient? Okay, so how many steps is this question? Well, um, kind of, I'd say one, we need to figure out a diagnosis. Um, two, maybe based off that diagnosis, uh, what is the patient at risk for? So maybe a two-step question, um, probably, probably a two-step question. So let's go ahead and take a look at the answer choices. And once again, we will go ahead and start at the bottom and we will work our way up. Answer choice E, Sheehan syndrome, D, preeclampsia, C, postpartum bleeding, B, infertility, A, disseminated intravascular coagulation. So once again, we're gonna go ahead and open up that poll. Go ahead and select the answer that you think is uh, the best answer choice, and we will talk about it in just a few seconds. Excellent, so once again, the poll has uh, been open for you. We'll give all of you a few seconds to respond, and then we'll go over the correct and incorrect answer choices. Looks like there's already a clear favorite. We'll wait until about two thirds of you have responded. And then as always, Faros will explain all of the answer choices and how we can get to the correct answer while avoiding the incorrect ones. I see a lot of people in the audience, uh, even some veterans, jumping ahead to find to answer the question uh, before the answer choices have been revealed. I encourage you to uh, stick to the process. Staying consistent is going to help you avoid mistakes on test day. And let's see what you selected. It looks like 51% of you selected DIC. So it was a clear favorite. Let's see if that's the correct answer. And indeed it is, and 51% of you got it right. So well done, everybody. Let me hand it off to Paro so you can explain to us why. Thank you, Sean. Great job, guys. So definitely a nice repro question here. So what is going on? So we have a lady with a pregnant, a primogravid woman, 32 weeks with sudden vaginal bleeding and 
painful abdominal cramps, and she hasn't had trauma, okay? We also know her blood pressure is a little low, and she's tachycardic. All things that are not good. The fetus is also, they tell us, in fetal distress. What are some other important things? Well, she's a smoker, and she's used cocaine. These are all things that, uh, when you, you start to wrap them together, really should make you be thinking about abruptio placentae, or placental abruption. Okay. Now, they said that this patient had, um, maybe, you know, they didn't really see abnormalities of plac placentation. However, um, certain bleeding, like retroplacental bleeding, uh, can be sometimes difficult to visualize on ultrasound. So always keep that in mind. So what is placental abruption? It's uh, the partial or complete uh, separation of the placenta from the uterine wall prematurely. So it's separated prematurely. Okay. Risk factors include smoking and cocaine, like this patient. Other things could be hypertension, trauma, and preeclampsia, which we don't think this patient has. So, what are some complications? Well, complications can be life threatening, and they include maternal shock, fetal death, and also DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. Why is that, you ask? Well, because tissue factor can enter into the maternal circulation and thus the patient is at risk for DIC. So great job with that. Let's talk about the other answer choices in case you were thinking those. Answer choice E, Sheehan syndrome. Uh, that's a condition of low pituitary function or hypopituitaryism, um, usually due to ischemia of the pituitary after a patient has, you know, postpartum bleeding. So if they're bleeding a lot after pregnancy. Um, uh, signs and symptoms may include, you know, um, like things like not being able to lactate, um, being intolerant to cold, um, and these usually present postpartum. Um, so not, not uh, what we'd be thinking in this patient. Answer choice D, preeclampsia. Uh, that's a condition of new onset hypertension uh, with either end organ dysfunction or proteinuria. And that's usually after the 20th week of pregnancy. Now, we know this patient's blood pressure isn't high and, in fact, is actually a little, little low. And they also told us the urinalysis shows no protein. And that's why we highlighted that, because that kind of points away from preeclampsia. Answer choice C, postpartum bleeding. Uh, this can occur for a variety of reasons, uh, trauma, coagulopathy, uterine atony. Um, postpartum bleeding can also be a symptom of um, placenta accreta, increta, percreta. Um, and those are your uh, various types of um, abnormal attachment, okay? In this patient's case, uh, postpartum bleeding is not what's going on, not what uh, this patient is at risk for. And lastly, answer choice B, infertility. Uh, this is a condition that you may start to suspect uh, if a pregnancy has been unsuccessful um, with attempts for over a year. Um, and that's not really what's going on in this question. Um, so the best answer choice here is A, and figuring out that that is a complication of step number one, and step number one is figuring out that this was a placental abruption. Oh, and then, I'm sorry, I forgot we had this image as well. So this is, uh, this is the image that Sean went ahead and pulled up. This is talking about placental abruption. Um, you can see there that it's saying premature separation of the placenta from the uterus before delivery. Risk factors that this patient had, smoking and cocaine. This patient had abrupt painful bleeding in the third trimester, okay, 32 weeks. And then also DIC is a, is a complication. So this all points towards this patient also having placental abruption. Excellent, thank you so much, Paris. Once again, a challenging question, so well done, everyone. You know, we talked about Rx Coach earlier, and I want to tell you a little bit about Rx Coach. So, you know, if you're one of those students that's, that's you know, struggling with multiple resources or struggling with test-taking skills or thinking, oh, I knew that answer, but you still got it wrong, or thinking, I, I can figure this out on my own, or it's just taking you too long to make the progress that you want to make, or even if you're already doing well, but you want to do better, Rx Coach is perfect for you. The first thing we do, we start you off with a personalized uh, uh, study plan, which you base on an initial assessment. Now, we are one of the only tutoring companies that's authored 
medical education resources, and we're actually in medical education prior to tutoring. So we have a lot of data, right? And because we've authored these resources, we can administer one of our assessments and then use that as a baseline to see details and make a personalized and customized study plan. Now, there are a lot of USMLE review programs out there, uh, but that's different from what we offer, right? Because everybody in the USMLE review program does the same thing at the same time, regardless of strengths and weaknesses or test taking skills. And oftentimes there isn't an emphasis on test taking skills. Unlike this program where you come to us, we make you a personalized study plan, and then you meet with your tutors at regular intervals. So for example, your tutor might say, okay, we're gonna start you off with patho or immuno or cardio or neuro, depending on your baseline. So study that subject and do what your tutor asks you to do, uh, and we'll incorporate all of the resources that you have and the ones that we believe will be important to your success based on your learning style. And then at the end of that week, for example, you'll meet with your tutor, they'll go over that topic, you'll be able to ask your tutor any questions you have, have concepts explained to you, and your tutor will have curated already from the question bank that we authored through our faculty portal, some questions that you'll do together on various topics uh, related to the subject you are studying. Your tutor will ask you, what's important in this sentence? What are you thinking? What's on your list of differentials? Why is the right answer right? Why is the wrong answer wrong? And as you have that conversation, we're able to see what those knowledge gaps are and bridge them along the way. We also get to work on test taking skills and we can identify patterns through our highly trained Rx coaches to identify exactly what those test taking deficiencies are to help you get to where you wanna be in a much more efficient way. Our students tell us two things. One, I got a higher score than I wanted or I met my goals and all of them have, or I got there quicker and my studying was more efficient. So if you're interested in working with our highly trained Rx certified tutors, please reach out to us at rx-coach.com. Once again, that's rx-coach.com. If you're interested in pricing, you can simply click on the pricing tab at rx-coach.com to see that information. And you can schedule a consultation with me via the free consultation button to discuss the program specifically and how it can benefit you. If you want some general study advice, uh, we know that not every student is in the uh, uh, financial position to uh, uh, obtain tutoring. So we've thought ahead, which is why we do these question labs, which is why we have firstaidteam.com, which has generalized study advice, blogs from our coaches, posts from our coaches, as well as a free study planner, which actually just was updated that you can uh, download and use to your benefit completely free of charge. So once again, if you're interested in Rx Coach, uh, please visit rx-coach.com and click on the free consultation tab so you can talk to me about the program and how it can benefit you. With that, let's go ahead and move on to our third question of the evening. I do see a quick question here about how long is Rx Coach? We have three different packages. The packages depend on the individual. Uh, and so it is an individualized program. It is not a course. It's individualized towards uh, each and every student or for each and every other uh, student, should I say. So with that, let's go ahead and get into our third question of the evening. Once again, the answer choices have been covered up and we will begin with the leading. Which of the following best describes the pathogen causing this patient's symptoms? Which of the best following, which of the following best describes the pathogen causing this patient's symptoms? <coughs> Sorry. An otherwise healthy 27-year-old man comes in for evaluation of an extremely painful ulcer on the shaft of his penis, which has been present for one week. He has not experienced penal discharge, difficulty with urination or fever. He has smoked one pack of cigarettes daily for the past 10 years and reports having nine sexual partners over the course of the past year. He takes no medications. On physical examination, a 1.5 centimeter ulcer with an arithmetic uh, base and a clearly demarcated border is noted on the distal shaft of the penis. The base of the ulcer bleeds when scraped. The patient's inguinal lymph nodes on the left side are swollen and tender on palpation and produce a purulent discharge. Which of the following best describes the pathogen causing this patient's symptoms? So we'll give all of you a second here to think about the relevant clues as I hand it off to Paris. But before I do, I do see a question about uh, the email address for Rx Coach. Once again, you can visit rx-coach.com and just click that contact us tab. Paris. Thank you, Sean. So once again, we will go ahead and show you what we think are the important clues 
in this vignette in the lead-in, and then also some important things going on here. So now we have a, a male patient, a 27-year-old male, and they're giving us uh, right away some things should be popping into your head. Painful ulcer on the penile shaft. Um, so right away, a few things are hopefully jumping out and starting to, uh, to really circulate in your brain, okay? They give us some more signs and symptoms about dis, uh, lack of discharge, um, uh, his, his nine sexual partners, and then they also give us a physical exam description of that ulcer, which is always going to be helpful um, in these type of reproductive lesion questions, okay? They tell us about uh, lymph nodes. They tell us about discharge as well from the lymph node. So all of these things really, um, we, we need to try to coalesce them and, and come up with um, some answers to the, the following steps. So what are those steps? Well, uh, we need to describe the pathogen causing the symptom. So what are the steps? How many number of steps are there? One, I think we need to figure out what is the disease? What's the diagnosis for these symptoms? Uh, two, what is the pathogen that is uh, causes that diagnosis or disease? And then three, I think it's interesting that they said best described. So the question didn't say which pathogen causes it. It says which best describes the pathogen. So I think there's probably a third step there about something about, you know, maybe micro related. So let's take a look at those answer choices at this probably three step question. So great. So we do have kind of a, a micro-ish uh, uh, tinge to this question as well. So answer choice E, obligate intracellular bacterium. D, gram-negative spirochete. C, gram-negative diplococcus. B, gram-negative coxobacillus. And A, double-stranded linear DNA virus. So we're going to go ahead and open up that poll. Go ahead and try to answer those steps and pick the answer choice you think is uh, the best answer, and we will talk about it in just a few seconds. Thank you, Paris. Another great multi-step question. So keep that thought process organized and select the answer you believe is correct. And then, of course, we'll go over the correct and incorrect answer choices. As always, we do have a special offer for all of you in attendance, which we'll uh, go over with you at the end. And we also have a raffle, and one of you will uh, be the lucky winner tonight of a very valuable prize. But you must be present to win, so <clears throat> make sure you stick around. I see the responses coming in. We'll give all of you a few more seconds here. All right, and let's take a look and see what you selected. It looks like 37% of you selected B, uh, gram-negative coxobacillus. And in second place was gram-negative spherocyte. So let's see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is B, and 37% of you got it right. So another challenging question. Let's have Boris walk us through it. Boris. Thank you, Sean. Definitely a tough question here. So let's talk about this question. So we know that there is a uh, painful penile ulcer, okay? So that's important. It's painful. What else do we know? Well, we know that this patient has uh, inguinal lymph adenopathy that also has purulent discharge. So at this point, um, you should really be thinking about what's called chancroid, okay? Chancroid is a sexually transmitted disease caused by hemophilus Ducreae, okay? It's a gram-negative coxobacilli. And let's take a look actually on the next page, the next slide, sorry. Um, you can see there the second, uh, yep, the second row, chancroid, painful genital ulcer, okay? So these ulcers are painful. And there is inguinal adenopathy. The bug is Haemophilus ducreae. And as we hopefully remember from micro, Haemophilus species are generally gram-negative coxobacilli. Let's take a look at some of these other things here on this table as well, okay? So at the very bottom, primary syphilis, that does present often with a chancre or an ulcer-type lesion um, in the genital region, but to keep in mind, that is painless. Right above that, lymphogranuloma venereum. That can also have lymph adenopathy, 
But again, the ulcers there are usually painless, okay? Gonorrhea and chlamydia usually present a little bit differently that, you know, with urethritis or epididymitis, prostatitis, um, not what we have going on in this patient, okay? So if we go back and look at our patient, you can see here that they told us that this ulcer was painful. They also told us um, that this patient has inguinal lymph nodes that are draining and tender. And you can see there kind of a representative image of um, what that would look like, inguinal lymph adenopathy. So it's usually definitely um, uh, noticeable. So let's talk about the other answer choices and why those are incorrect, maybe what you were thinking there. So answer choice E, obligate intracellular bacterium. This is likely getting at chlamydia. Now remember we said there's a certain type, certain uh, serotypes of chlamydia, L1 to L3, that can cause lymphogranuloma venereum. But again, um, those ulcers are generally painless. Answer choice D, this is getting at uh, trypanoma pallidum or uh, the, the pathogen for syphilis. And again, that ulcer or chancre is called, is painless. Uh, and usually without inguinal lymphadenopathy like this. Answer choice C, a gram-negative diplococcus. Uh, this can cause gonorrhea, as we mentioned, and you know usually presents differently with urethritis um, and uh, epididymitis or prostatitis. And then lastly, answer choice A, double-stranded linear DNA virus. Um, hopefully you guys remember that is talking about herpes viruses. So these usually cause uh, vesicular eruptions or vesicles in the genital region if um, or the mouth region as well, um, most commonly, and, and that's not what's going on here. So the best answer choice here is that this is chancroid, uh, and that the pathogen causing it is Haemophilus ducreae, and that the best micro description is answer choice B. Excellent, thank you, Barnes. <clears throat> I apologize for my cough. Uh, uh, just had a little, uh, little cough attack, but nothing to worry about. So. On to our last question of the evening, after which we will reveal our special offer and select our winner from the raffle. But let's try to finish strong here. Once again, the answer choices are covered up and we will begin with the lead in. Which of the following would most likely be seen on histologic examination of the scaly patch? Which of the following would most likely be seen on histologic examination of the scaly patch. We'll give all of you a few moments here to let us know in the question box how many steps you think this question will require. And then we'll read the lead in. All right, I see the responses coming in. Let's go ahead and read that lead in. Read that vignette rather. A 52-year-old white woman who has never given birth comes to the physician for an annual checkup. <clears throat> she has a 10-pack year smoking history and a family history significant for early mastectomies in her mother and grandmother. She has two glasses of wine every night with dinner and occasionally drinks three or more servings of alcohol on the weekends with friends. Vital signs are within normal limits. <clears throat> She has had a 14 kilogram or 30 pound weight gain over the past five years. Findings on physical examination are notable for a red scaly patch on her right nipple and palpable axillary nodes. Palpation reveals a firm mass in her right breast and a serosanguineous discharge from the right nipple. Which of the following would most likely be seen on histologic examination of the scaly patch? I want all of you to start thinking about the important clues in this vignette as I hand it off to Parth. Thank you, Sean. So once again, we are going to show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette in the lead-in. And the reason we're doing this is that hopefully you can pick up on, you know, what we think are important to, to highlight and, and what are some things that uh, maybe you don't have to highlight. Um, and hopefully with this repetition that you're seeing from us, you can start to incorporate this um, into your question answering uh, time as well, okay? So again, demographics, 52-year-old white woman, um, anytime we have reproductive, as I mentioned, you know, have they had children before? Have they given birth? 
Um, if so, how many? Always important, okay? They give us some interesting family history there, okay? And then also, they give us some other social history things, and then they give us uh, probably the most important is the physical exam findings, okay? Um, and hopefully those uh, things that they tell you, you know, we're starting to incorporate them, our, our, our brain is starting to churn a little bit. Um, so let's take a look at this lead-in. So most likely to be seen on histologic exam of the scaly patch, okay? So how many steps is this question? Uh, I think one, you know, we need to figure out what is that scaly patch? What's the diagnosis? And then two, what would we see on pathology or histologic exam of that scaly patch? So probably a nice two-step question here. Let's go ahead and take a look at those answer choices. Um, and once again, once again, we're gonna start at the bottom and work our way up. Answer choice E, solid pattern with an area of central necrosis. D, large cells with clear halos. C, fibrovascular structures lined by ductal epithelium. B, extracellular mucus surrounding clusters of tumor cells. And A, cells presenting in a linear pattern within breast stroma. So we're gonna go ahead and open up that poll. Go ahead and select the answer choice you think is uh, the best answer and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Excellent, thank you, Paras. This is our last question of the evening, so let's try to finish strong. And of course, we will have our special offer and the raffle for you right afterwards. We see some uh, good engagement tonight. We appreciate all of you being here. You know, we always appreciate uh, growing our audience. We can help even more and more people, especially during everything what we're dealing with now. So if you have friends or colleagues who'd be interested, please let them know. All right, a few more seconds here as we wrap up our lab for this evening. All right, let's see what you selected. It looks like 41% of you selected E, uh, sorry, C rather, fibrovascular stru uh, structures lined by ductal epithelium. So let's see what the correct answers are. And the correct answer is actually D, large cells with clear halos. And 19% of you got it right, so definitely a tough question. So I'm gonna hand it off to Paras so he can explain to us why that is the correct answer. Par. Thank you, Sean. Definitely a tough question here, but definitely something that we need to know um, and be prepared for uh, when step one comes around, okay? So what is going on here? Well, we know this patient is what we'd call nulla paris. She's never uh, given birth, okay? She's got a red scaly patch on her right nipple that's got serosang discharge, okay? We also know she has some lymphadenopathy. So all of these things are not good, right? Especially lymphadenopathy, okay? What is this pointing to, a, uh, what di diagnosis is this pointing to? Well, this is pointing to Paget's disease of the breast. Let's go ahead and look at the next slide. Um, and we've actually kind of highlighted Paget's disease, okay? Paget's disease is an extension of an underlying breast cancer that then becomes uh, contiguous with the skin of the nipple. So a lot of times in dermatology, when we have patients who come with this, we need to make sure that it's not an underlying breast cancer. And it could be, if so, it would uh, be what we call Paget's disease, okay? Now, when you look at that on the picture on the bottom left, you'll see that it kind of just looks like an eczematous patch, uh, but you need to keep in mind that it's on the breast and that could be an underlying malignancy, okay? Now, that picture on the right, you can see here, this is what Paget's disease is. You have these clear, kind of pale cells that have made their way up into the epidermis. You shouldn't normally have those cells in the epidermis. Remember our layers of the skin, we should have a nice basal layer, okay? Spinosum, granulosum, and then uh, corneum layer, okay? And, and we see that there's some weird cells in there, okay? 
And those are kind of uh, clear cells with this halo around it. And that's really what pagets, uh, pagetoid spread or paget type cells are, okay? So when we go back to our question and we look at the answer choice, now it becomes kind of clear, oh yeah, she has this scaly patch on her right nipple, okay? This may be an underlying breast cancer, which is also uh, suspicious given the lymphadenopathy, uh, the discharge, and then if it's pagets, we would see those large clear cells with halos around it, okay? What are the other answer choices getting at? Well, answer choice E, that's getting at uh, a specific subtype of DCIS or ductal, ductal carcinoma in situ, okay? Not what we have here. We diagnose that this is Paget's disease. C, uh, this is getting at intraductal papillomas, okay? They're characterized by those fibrovascular stru structures. Uh, and they may describe nipple discharge, okay? Uh, but they usually present as small lumps behind or next to the nipple. They don't usually produce a scaly patch like this patient. Answer choice B, this is getting at a mucinous carcinoma, okay? It's a rare form of breast cancer. And they uh, usually on palpation, it kind of has like a gelatinous type consistency. This is a little bit more firm that they told us, okay? And lastly, answer choice A, this is getting at like an infiltrating lobular carcinoma where you have uh, cells in a linear pattern within the stroma. Also, these masses um, are oftentimes actually bilateral, which uh, is not the case here in this patient, so another point against that. So the best answer choice here is D, but that obviously came after knowing that step one, that this was Paget's disease of the breast. So hopefully you guys um, learned a lot from today's sessions and you learned kind of how we like to dissect questions. Um, and I will hand it off to you, Sean. Thank you very much, Boris. So, you know, a couple more things here before I raffle. I want to um, show you the uh, question IDs from this evening. So feel free to take a quick picture or screenshot of this slide.